Hi there, I am the Sierra Ninja, and on today's episode of the Oops Factor, I feel really honored to have one of the top 10 tech bloggers in the world coming on the show. I'd like to welcome Hillel Fuld. Welcome to the show, Hillel. We're not off to a good start, my friend. I'm not top 10 tech bloggers in the world. There's some stupid list that someone put me in there, but I, it's not really true. But, who, you know, these lists, whatever, I share them. Everyone else shares them. We're happy, but I'm definitely not in the top 10 tech bloggers in the world. Ah. Uh... I was thinking maybe it was a marketing gimmick, but I've seen it referenced multiple places. So I thought, okay, maybe I could use there, that. There, There is literally not a single uh, metric by which I'm number 10 tech blogger in the world. Literally not one. Okay, fine. I will, I will note this. I know this has been recorded. I don't mind people. I'll admit that, you know, we'll do that next time. Now, the reason why people, are, you may be wondering why I have something floating over my head is I know that you are absolutely into drones. And I would like to know how you started to get into drones as a hobby. I wish I had a good story. I mean, I'm just a tech geek and I love gadgets of all kinds. And so when drones started to hit the market, I, you know, just did my thing on Twitter. I talked about it and then uh, one company sent me my first drone and then I started getting hooked. So yeah, there's no, there's no amazing story there. Okay. What's the most amazing thing you've done with drones? What is the most amazing thing I have done with drones? I mean, to me, just, you know, flying it like in northern Israel and just the beautiful landscapes of Israel. Truth is, I don't even have to go to northern Israel. I, even if I, when I fly around my house in Beit Shemesh, which is a town in between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, it's absolutely gorgeous. So to me, just flying in Israel and recording the amazing, amazing landscapes. It is, is really quite amazing. I think I've seen every single one of the videos you put up of the drones and I'm just amazed because I've, I've flown drones occasionally myself and just sometimes to pick it up, especially the more advanced drones can be quite tricky. And like, you know, the 3D relationship where you are, where the drone is and such. And, and you just seem absolutely natural at it. Well, you know, since, since this podcast is about failures, I will say that a couple of weeks ago, I was flying my DJI Mavic 3, which is a $6,000 drone. Uh, at my kid's baseball game, and I was flying it about a mile away, and everything was fine. Well, it turns out that the thing doesn't have, I guess, obstacle avoidance on its sides, and I was flying sideways, and I flew right into a tree. And remember, this is a mile away, and so I'm watching on my on my screen how this thing just plummets to its death a mile away. So I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm done. Like, it's lost. So I walked in the direction, and I'm getting closer, and then I hit, you know, find my drone, and it starts beeping, and I found it in between bushes. Minimal damage. It still flies. But that was terrifying. No, and that's not the first time that it has happened to me. Actually, I flew a drone in Caesarea in Caesarea, and apparently I was too close to Netanyahu's house. And uh, his security took my drone down and it was gone forever. I, I can imagine. I thought you were about to say baseball game. I thought you were about to say that, you know, it was a mile away and the kid really hit the baseball very, very hard and yeah. it hit the drone. That's funny. That, that would be cool. No, I just lost it. Just crashed. I recently saw was watching on YouTube about people who build rockets and, and launch them. Not quite. Elon Musk style, but like homemade rockets and things. And they were filming drones and they managed on a swoop as the rocket was taking off, the rocket hit the drone. What are the chances of that? Wow, it was nuts. Indeed. So moving on from drone and stuff and, and talking about baseball and things to the oops factor, what do you have to share? Because I'm sure you have seen one or two tech companies along the way, as well as a variety of other stuff in life. And I'm really curious to know. How long do we have, man? I have to choose because there are so many, so many failures um, from, you know, getting an offer to work at Waze in the marketing department that I rejected um, to offering to join a company as co-founder that ended up selling to Facebook for many, many hundreds of millions of dollars to not buying my options. Um, my first job that ended up selling for $900 million um, to two failed startups. You choose, man, you choose. Well, go for it to some, something that you think, you know, the audience is into it, you know, in sort of day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month life, or maybe even, you know, relating to positions and moving around that people might be able to relate to. I mean, so I had a startup back, uh, I would say about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, that was a platform for team communication. So if you have a team back okay. then, you would use Skype and you would use you know, Google, Google Drive, you would use Dropbox, you would use WhatsApp, you were using a thousand tools. And that obviously yep. was not very efficient. So we came up with a product called Zula. Uh, and it was one, one place for all your team communication. Uh, we launched in San Francisco at uh, a big conference, we won the Audience Choice Award, we raised money from Microsoft, everything was going amazing, until it wasn't, until Slack was born, 
and they put us out of business. And the biggest lesson was timing. Timing is everything. It was also a question of execution. They built a much better product, but we were just too early. <laughs> wow. So would there have been anything that you could have thought of, you know, if you could go back in time, how you might have pivoted to make it successful then against things like Slack? And obviously now we have Teams and other things. Right. I, I just think we, I would have built a better product. I just don't think it was, you know, we were alone in the market. So, you know, we didn't really care so much about execution. We just wanted to build a product that worked, but it was not good enough. So, you know, that's something that I think I would do again. But yeah, I mean, timing is everything. And it, it was just too early. I don't know if there's, that's something you could solve. But um, it's funny because after that company failed, we, we launched another company um, using the same technology, basically. And that also was too early. That we built an amazing product. Uh, it was basically Clubhouse for, for you know, pre-Clubhouse. Uh, it was like, you know, a, a podcasting platform from your phone. Uh, and it was a really good product. And we did a really good job, but it was too early. No one wanted a podcast from, from their phone. So yeah, it just didn't succeed. I hear, because that, that sort of answered the question I was about to ask. I was going to say, you know, if you have the a big idea for something, now you may not be the only people. And sometimes there's that rush to market to bring out a product, but it's not got all the edges rounded off and it's not absolutely sleek and perfect. But sometimes it's right. better to, bring it out and be the first ones there versus spending some more time on the product, but then you have to worry about the competitors coming out, I guess. I mean, there's a, you know, this is a debate. We could debate this for a long time. I'm not sure that first matters, right? Obviously no company that you know today as a successful company was first to market, right? Google was number 17 search engine. Apple wasn't first, Blackberry, Nokia, Facebook wasn't first. It was MySpace and on and on and on. Uh, so they weren't first. They just did it better. Uh, so I'm not sure first is important, uh, and also, on the other hand, the flip side is I'm not sure that you have to wait to launch until you're perfect. It's important to get out there, but not to be yep. out there because you're first, to be out there so you can get feedback from people and see how you can make the product better. And would that be out there, out there with a proper launch, like doing an alpha and a beta programs? I mean, there's no, there's no right answer to that. It depends, obviously, on a million different circumstances, but I'm not a fan of the whole we're staying under the radar thing. I, my last meeting just now, an hour ago, was with a a venture capitalist, uh, you know, an investment firm, and it's completely under the radar. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, how do you expect entrepreneurs to hear about you if you're under the radar? And they're like, yeah, but we don't want to, we want to focus on investing, not on marketing. I'm like, those things aren't mutually exclusive. There's no reason whatsoever to be under the radar. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of the whole stealth thing. To me, you know, you should be doing marketing basically from day one, even before you have a product, because once you have a product, you already need that audience to download your app or to use your product. If you start doing marketing, once you have a product, you miss the train. That is true. You want to sort of build up the hypes, then people start getting onto the product just by the right. idea of it. And then when you launch it, maybe they'll be a bit more forgiving if it's not quite there yet. But uh, Right, right. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So some people love working with software, building applications. Some people love working with hardware and actually building physical products and obviously using software for that. What would your advice be? And I know that you are an advisor to many different companies, you know, for social media and other stuff and engagement. But if somebody had an idea for something, building a better mousetrap or something, and I know that this would depend on what the product is in the market for, but in general, how would you suggest what could look like a successful path to get them started? Because some people are really worried that they'll just never actually start it because they're so afraid of failing in that. Right. So first of all, it's important to say that if we're being honest, a good idea is worthless. A good idea is, everyone has good ideas and okay. none of the companies that won had a good idea. Facebook didn't have a unique idea. Twitter didn't have a unique idea. Google didn't have a unique idea. They just did it better. So ideas are worthless. That's number one. Number two, if you do have an idea and you think it has legs, take a breather and spend about a month studying the landscape. Who else has tried to solve this problem that you're trying to solve? Why did they fail? Why did they succeed? How are you different? Build yourself a market landscape of 100 companies in your space. That doesn't mean 100 wow. companies that are doing the same thing as you. It means 100 companies that are in your space. So if you're building a social network for dog owners, then you're not going to find a direct competitor, but you are a competitor of Facebook because now dog owners are going to Facebook. So you want to take them away from Facebook. So you are a competitor. So anyone okay. that's in your landscape, make sure you, you can look at them, visualize them. And only then should you decide whether to move forward or not, or change directions or not. But without doing competitive analysis and market research, you have absolutely no chance of succeeding, like zero. Okay. Okay. So don't just stick with the idea stage. And um, you obviously need to forward for that and do appropriate market research to ensure that you know who your competitors are so you can build that better mousetrap. What would be the right. next stage? 
The next stage is get your product, obviously build a prototype, right? You know, as, as bare bones as possible. Don't go spend money on building a perfect product, a bare bones product, get it in front of five, 10, 15, 20 family members, friends, whatever you want to do, and just gather as much data as you can, see how people use it, see how people love it, see why they hate it, where they're getting stuck. Just gather as much information as you can about the product, then iterate, make it better. They get it in front of you know more people. Then iterate and get it better. And that's that's the process of entrepreneurship. Just feedback, iteration, feedback, iteration, feedback, iteration. And then you know once you feel like it's actually ready for mass market, then you can do a launch. Um, you know, and then there's the whole PR world and and, and yeah. you know content and social, and then the whole world of marketing comes into play. That's actually a really important point that you make is about the getting it in front of people. Um, you know, as organizations, when we go into implement solutions for places and whether that's a single man, band, one man band, or that's a massive, you know, thousands of employees who go in, you take a look and you deliver solutions, whether that's hardware solutions or software solutions for it, you in your mind are trying to understand what people actually do and you implement the system in such a way as you think what they're doing. But it's only when it comes to that initial playback or the further playback sessions, okay. do you actually understand what happens when users actually go ahead and use it and carry out processes and, and do whatever they need to do. And that's where you need right. to iterate. Right. It's, it's, it's a real problem. Entrepreneurs, by definition, obviously, they need to be super passionate, right? Otherwise, there's no chance. Yeah. Because they're super passionate, they, they're, it's very hard to get like constructive criticism or you know, to consider pivoting because it's their baby. So when you give them feedback, the, the kind of instinct of every, every entrepreneur is to be defensive. But that's not going to work. Like if you're defensive and you can't take criticism, there's no way you're going to succeed. Um, so yeah, it's a very important process to like, you know, seed it to a couple of users, see how they use it and then iterate. I guess there are possibly quite a few people out there who've just become so emotionally invested in their baby that they just can't bear to hear criticism and therefore their exactly. products aren't succeeding because of that. Right. hundred percent. Um, what would you say some really good examples of where this sort of process has gone very well, you know, for Fiber. small people say. Fiber. Fiverr, okay. you know, Micha Kaufman, CEO of Fiverr, built this marketplace for $5 services. Anybody wants a CV made or whatever, $5. And he literally gave it to like five family members or 10 family members. And it just, boom, spread like wildfire. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that that's a good strategy. You can't depend on that. But you can, if you build a product that people actually want and need, then yeah, it will spread. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to insinuate that you should, you know, if you build it, they will come. That's, that's BS. Right. If you build it, no one's going to hear about it until you do marketing. So, um, you know, uh, but but if you're building a great product and people will use it and people will, you know, spread it and people will you know continue to use it. So product and execution is the most important thing here for sure. That is true. That is true. Then the two go hand in hand, really. Yep. Very important. Where, with your view on the tech world, do you see the next big thing at the moment that you're allowed to talk about? It's behind you. It's behind you and behind me. Drone okay. technology, drone technology, the two, the two, the two it's called it verticals that excite me the most are human computer interaction. And I'll explain what that means in a second and drones. So drones, you know, it, I don't, I don't think there's anything that can illustrate how far we've come better than a drone, because you're talking about a device that fits in your hand that can fly 10, 15 kilometers record in 4k, you know, 48 megapixel pictures, um, you know, can fly 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour for 40 minutes of flight. And you could just walk into any store and buy it. It's crazy. Like drone technology is crazy. Now, today, it's just kind of a novelty. It's a cool thing to have. It's not really that practical. That's going to change. Over the next five to 10 years, drones are going to be a major part of our daily lives. Obviously, deliveries and medical supplies and sports and many, many other you know applications. But drones are about to become really, really big. And the second thing is how we interact with our computers. If you think about it, you know, we're still using a mouse. Like, how ridiculous is that? You know, but we but we think like our phones, our smartphones, we think they're so sophisticated. And our kids are going to laugh at us that we walked around with big slabs of glass in our face. Right. So yeah. the way we're going to interact with our computers is going to fundamentally change. You know, that's why every single one of the companies is building glasses right now. Every single one, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they're all building AR glasses. Now, I don't know you know, how we're going to interact with our computers, whether it's through hand motions in the air or whatever it may be, but you can be sure that in the next five to 10 years, we will not be using a mouse or a smartphone. Yeah, I mean, I was part, I remember when Google Glass released its first product, I rushed to get a copy of it. It was really cool. There were some problems with it, but it was cool. But I'm also reminded if you think of, you know, the Apollo missions and the space missions, the amount of computing power that they had to send man to the moon is less than a modern smartwatch. 
much less than a modern smartwatch. And you think that was, you know, what is it, 40, 50 years ago or so? Now think of the amount of time and how quickly technology has advanced since then. What is life going to be like in even 20 or 30 years? 100%. There's no question things are going to change very fast. Obviously, autonomous driving, like we're not going to have steering wheels in our cars for very much longer. Everything's going to change. It's going to be a new world very soon. I'm going to miss that. I do like actually manually driving. I've always liked a manual car with a gear stick in order to do that. So I think I'm going to miss that where that goes. Well, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to buy one because you can't have half the roads autonomous and half yep. the roads not autonomous. Everyone's going to go autonomous. You're not going to be able to buy a regular car with a steering wheel. Yeah, that is, that is true. I said it's going to be a sad thing for it. So I know that you love tech and that you love gadgets. What piece of tech or gadget do you have your eye on to get next? I've wanted an iMac computer since I can remember. I have absolutely no use case for it. I don't even use it. I barely use my laptop. Forget a desktop. I have zero use case for it. I don't know why I want it. Well, I do know why I want it because it's sexy, but I don't uh, I don't have any use case for it, but I, I, I very much want to buy myself an iMac. Are we talking about like one of the retro ones with the different colors on the back? No, no, no. An iMac, a modern iMac, you know, the screen oh, that has iMac. the whole computer okay. built in. Ah, okay. The modern all-in-one Apple solution. Got it. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Right. Well, I look forward to hopefully seeing you posting up about it at some point and figuring out a use I, for it. I can't justify that 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 expensive of a purchase without any specific application. I will literally never use it, like literally. So I don't, I don't think I'm going to buy it, but you ask what I want. That's what I want. Got it. Wonderful. Well, Hillel, so much, thank you so much for your time and coming on the show. It's been really appreciated. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. No problem. Viewers, we hope that you've enjoyed listening to our talk about technology. Feel free to check out the rest of the Oops Factor playlist, subscribe to the channel, take a look at the blog. Also feel free to take a look at Hillel across, I think, every single social media channel that's out there, and I will include that in the description. And if you would like to come on the show, hit the link somewhere in the description below, put in your details, and I'd love to have you on. But above all, have an amazing day.